not a lot of ways to get more funds in the mid game. There is one method that dares not speak its name. And that's because export bad. But if you are some kind of lunatic trying to break new ground on forbidden strategies, perhaps you could try exporting once per turn and leave your car prices at one for the rest of the game. Who knows? Maybe those purchases will work out somehow. Work out somehow. Work out somehow. Work out somehow. Welcome back. I've got something special for you today. A look into the early explorations of new strategy. Or maybe an exciting new form of cardinal sin. I warn you though, the price I paid for this knowledge was severe. In following up on my Otter video, I wanted to genuinely look into whether or not export could be made useful by exporting and trying to sell your cards at a lower cost. This is that game. To keep better track of this strategy's success, keep an eye out for these icons here. I was fortunate to find that my three opponents actually had good command of each of their factions, though the Cats player did admit that they're fairly new. In fact, on the first turn, their Crows player decides to nearly give me a goddamn heart attack. This could be a bomb. I don't know. My hand's decent, but not amazing. I can save Sabos, the boot, and the ambush, and everything else is not really interesting. The good news is that I'm late in turn order, so I can set my prices to one here and probably make a couple buys before my first turn. In fact, the Corvids actually buy here. Then they run it back as they realize they could flip their extortion and steal my ambush anyways, because taking random cards always works out as badly as possible. As you can already see, we've got a rather weird draft. We're very low reach with myself, the Vagabond, and Crows on the board, but it's not unplayable. In fact, it's very playable. Everyone here is capable of policing everybody else, and we're also capable of exploding ahead of the board if we get ignored. It just goes to show you that not having two militant factions isn't always a bad thing. The Crows take a pretty ambitious first turn, setting up a plot right next to the keep. It's kind of an unusual choice, but it makes sense to get in the way of the cats early here if they really want to avoid them running away with the game. Since they just flipped an extortion and they're right next to the keep, my guess is that this is probably a snare. The Vagabond takes a fairly standard turn, opening a ruin and getting their bag. And for my turn, since I only received a purchase from the Vagabond, I don't think it's worthwhile putting a trade post down quite so early, so I'm just going to draw cards. The coins are a rather nice pull here, but the rest of my hand kind of sucks. I think I'll set my prices at two and maybe sell a couple of cards in the next round. I managed to break even pretty immediately, because the cats end up buying my saboteurs and they spend their turn moving twice and building a sawmill on the opposite side of the map. Not the most ambitious first turn, but I can understand wanting to set up your sawmills on the far sides. Our Vagabond player asks a fairly interesting question about whether or not I get targeted because I'm recognizable in the community, and the answer is yes. Even my meager status as a niche micro-celebrity on the internet is enough to influence people's decisions. Imagine, if you will, you sat down at a tournament game and you didn't know anyone there, but suddenly that one dude from the videos shows up. It's unavoidable that you might overestimate their abilities and probably target them disproportionately as a result. While I don't blame people for doing this, hiding my identity at RootCon brought my tournament record from 0-6 to 2-9. We're back to the Corvid's turn, and they're going to take advantage of the empty board by plotting twice. I don't disagree. It turns out that that snare I was expecting ended up being a raid after all. I figured it wasn't going to be the choice because being next to the keep it would have been suboptimal, but I suppose that only made it harder to guess. The coins in my hand end up going to the Vagabond, a choice that I have mixed feelings about. At the very least, it's paid off my gamble of underpricing my hand. Only with the hindsight of editing should I have realized that this would have been an indicator that the Vagabond had the hammer in their hand already, and was just waiting to craft it. Without it, there's no reason the Vagabond would be picking up the coins at all. Here the crows reveal that not only did they take my ambush, but they took one from the cats as well, in addition to two more ambushes in their hand. Fabulous. Back to my turn though, what kind of Corvid player would I be if I allowed someone to play them effectively in front of me? Yes, with four plots on the board, these crows are primed to burst to ten points before any of us have even hit five, and I just... my pride cannot allow that. 
These single-cost bunny cards will be helpful to my strategy in the long run, so I'm not going to use them to guess. We'll just resort to the old-fashioned way. Sure, it'll cost me a lot of warriors, but I have enough time to recoup these losses without losing too much tempo. Now it's time to start enacting my plan. We're gonna export these tunnels, put our prices at one, and draw some cards, and... Holy shit, what a draw. Okay. I may have intended to lowball my prices, but even I can't give Propaganda Bureau away for one. Well, I have standards, after all. If nobody buys the Propaganda Bureau, I'll craft it myself and give the crows a hard time, but three funds seems like a reasonable amount to give that up for. The cats end up attacking the crows' raid and reinforcing their argument that they do in fact have four ambushes. I don't doubt them, but with their ability to explode this early on, it simply turns them from an unavoidable problem to an expensive unavoidable problem. To coin a phrase from Magic the Gathering, sometimes you gotta make them have it. The cats are going to spend a bird card here so they can overwork, build, build, and battle. In truth, this is a pretty rough turn. They put two sawmills instead of getting their third recruiter, didn't recruit on this turn, the Vagabond has two swords and is headed straight for the keep on their turn, and to fuel that overwork they spent a bird card. Cats are certainly a hard faction to optimize, but rarely have I seen a turn quite as dangerous as this one. The crows follow up on their bluster by buying the Propaganda Bureau from me. I will savor these funds for the rest of their lives. Both myself and the crow player are aware that the crows will have to slow their roll if they want to stay alive here. As a result, I encourage them to go and fight the Vagabond, who is currently poised to make a bunch of points off of the keep. Having the crows do it would slow them and the Vagabond down, which would be good for me because it's not my turn in the first place and I can't actually do anything about it. It is also, in a very ontological sort of way, the right thing to do, since the crows are immediately before the Vagabond's turn. Ah, that I should be so fortunate to live in such a world. The crows choose greed instead, however, and end up plotting and tricking, oddly enough. They swap their keepside raid for the snare they put up in the top corner, which is actually a fairly thoughtful play. It's not going to prevent the cats from transferring wood through that clearing, but it's going to make their lives very difficult if they want to build anywhere on the southwest corner. With their last action, they choose to set up for next turn. Our Vagabond proves to be a merciful one, as instead of destroying the keep for several points, they aid the cats in exchange for the bag they crafted earlier, and take the raft to the other side. It appears that our Vagabond has also been rather unlucky, as they've managed to draw everything except the hammer from their first three ruins, and now must cross the lake to get it. This is somewhat fortunate for me, as I can now battle them to slow them down a bit. The crow is gracious enough to confirm that one bird ambush remains unaccounted for, which means I might be eating it momentarily. With two warriors on my trade post and two swords on the Vagabond, I'm not at risk of triggering trade disruption on myself, but a 2-2 roll will make this an expensive fight nonetheless. With Propaganda Bureau accounted for and no warriors to work with, I suppose this is as good a time as any to continue my export strategy. We'll craft Charm Offensive for some extra cards, and then export a warrior and draw as many cards as we can get away with. We don't want the Vagabond to be any more of a threat than they already are, so we're going to discard the sword we drew. This, however, is the point of the game when I realize I have a small problem. There are two rabbit clearings that I've already placed trade post in, and the cats have taken over the other two clearings on the river. This is making it quite difficult to get trade posts down. Fortunate for me that the cats are eager customers, buying out my bird ambush and the tea I had. As much as I would have loved to have those two points, having to set up a mouse trade post is currently my greatest problem. In hindsight, it would have been best to go down to that southwestern mouse clearing to put a trade post and then return to fight the Vagabond, but as I always say, hindsight is for suckers. The cats finally find the opportunity to build their third recruiter, use it, and then consolidate their warriors into a much more respectable position. The crows persist in their optimistic strategy, placing down two plots, one of which is in the crux of the Northern Pass. While placing this particular plot, they hesitate for a while, which leads me to believe that it might not be a raid. As it stands, the crows are currently tapped out on warriors, and triggering a raid now would be largely a waste of those resources. Doubly so, with the keep being adjacent. The Vagabond crafts their second hammer just as the crow player is begging for their funds back. A revolting turn of affairs for everyone. Following it up with a crossbow craft, the Vagabond is now too well equipped for a Maya taste. But the good news is the last of those corvid ambushes goes into damaging some of their new items. Three hits on either side is a good start, but not enough to put them in the forest. Since they've overfilled their bags, they're forced to discard the torch on their turn, which 
at least ensures that they're not going to be doing any questing or stealing for the rest of the game. With both of their hammers and swords still at large, however, they're as potent a threat as ever, and I can't trust the crows to handle it, so I guess I will have to. Naturally, my generous altruism is rewarded with an immediate 0-0 roll. At least I'm then able to follow it up with a real roll in order to secure the forest turn. Because I'm trying to avoid recruiting here, I actually spend the cat funds to put down a trade post so that I have two warriors available. Exporting has actually proved fairly successful so far, so long as you don't need a lot of your own funds. Losing a lot of my warriors early and struggling to reach most clearings has indeed been detrimental, but the amount of buys I've gotten in the mid-game has been genuinely surprising. My previous turns have taught me, however, that you don't want to export until you've drawn your cards, because you never know what you're going to end up with. This caution pays off immediately as I draw the coins. I would rather keep those points to myself, so we're going to set our prices at three. The Cats player successfully guesses the raid plot in the northern clearing, demonstrating immediately that I must be fucking washed up, because both of my guesses have been wrong. While the cats recruit, re-establish their wood chain, and build a sawmill, the crows explain to me that they felt they would have had enough recruits after plotting in order to gain value from that raid. Granted, that value would not be points, which they currently desperately need. Having lost both of their plots from last turn, the crows opt to replace them in virtually the same locations. This is the situation I would have wanted to avoid as a crow player. Leaving loose cats all over the board has made it difficult to place plots anywhere that would be safe, and bursting ahead of the table so early has made you a target. The price for their rampant hubris is that they will use coffin makers to convert a cat in order to defend their extortion. They cite the saboteurs I crafted last turn as part of the reason, but the fact of the matter is, both coffin makers and their propaganda bureau are a major threat, and if they had crafted both, I would have to choose only one to remove. As it stands, I get to have my cake and eat it too, while the crows do not. On my turn, I find myself in a bit of a bind, as I'm still wanting for that mouse trade post. And in focusing on that, I end up misplaying this turn quite badly. I'm confident that the cats are going to disable the plot up north, so I end up putting a trade post in cat territory rather than moving down to the bottom left mouse. This is suboptimal. It would have been better for me to move down to that bottom left mouse, place a trade post, craft and use League of Adventurous Mice to leave, and then follow through the rest of my turn, possibly guessing the plot if I wanted to remain safe. This is one of the only turns where I've received protectionism, so I actually have the otter funds to do this, but I wasn't paying attention to it at the time. Instead, I've ended up with fewer consolidated warriors and spent valuable foreign funds instead of my own. I'm committed to my export strategy, however, so we're going to try it again. And it's this decision, with a handful of bird cards, that will lead to one of the most exciting cat turns you will ever see. That was a nine-point cat turn. Probably something I should have been watching out for while trying to export. For a brief moment, the Corvids buy my last card, rounding out their fun contribution to an even four, but it was not to be, as they revert the choice moments later. From this position, I do have enough funds to jump to 20 points, however, but it would be the last thing I did. Instead, we're going to have to do something about cats, and I don't know how much we can actually do. Our good fortune has it that the cats have stacked up most of their buildings in only a few clearings, but unfortunately they've taken the rather wise choice of spreading their sawmills out as much as they can. I believe I was incorrect earlier, and that it was the Corvid player who said they were new to the faction. They were under the mistaken impression that their snare was going to prevent the cats from being able to transfer wood through their clearing, when in fact it's only rule that they need. They do trick that snare on top of a sawmill and bring the raft over to the Vagabond, who now has a pretty easy shot of wiping out that clearing. 
Well, they aren't able to take out the whole clearing, the cats, oddly enough, choose to sacrifice the sawmill rather than their workshop. Traditional thinking goes that when you have two workshops, it's great to sacrifice one of them because you can rebuild it for a single wood over and over again. My turn has arrived and the trend of having to police my betters continues unabated. I'm the only one in a position to handle the corner fox clearing, and because I can, I must. Spending my own funds to muster trade posts, I marshal the largest army I can manage without losing myself too many points. Now my noble duty begins. Are you fucking serious? You would be appalled at how often this situation happens to me. Clearly I shouldn't have placed that rabbit trade post, but how the hell was I supposed to know this would happen? There is a path to victory for the cats here if they move, build a sawmill, and destroy both of my trade posts, but I consider it some small solace that they will need to roll well in order to succeed. It is fortunate, however, that I don't have any cards in my hand, as one bird card was all they need to complete this plan, and they don't have it. They reinforce their workshop using tunnels, but because the snare is there, they cannot use the raft to fish for a bird card. Kudos to the crows, after all. On their turn, the crows commit to battling the only clearing with two sawmills, but unfortunately their luck with crows is as bad as mine is, and they fail to take out anything. The vagabond is now in prime position to clean up. In spite of my protestations, the vagabond destroys the cardboard that would have been my only solace for this gross injustice. Continuing the trend of god-awful rolls, however, they fail to destroy all the cardboard in my clearing and don't actually find enough points to win the game this turn. Back to my turn, and the best I can achieve is destroying two pieces of cat cardboard while placing the last pair of my trade posts. And that is an otter game. I didn't expect the export strategy to be as effective as it turned out to be. Realistically, it shouldn't have gotten me past 20 points, let alone 25. I'll have to try this strategy again sometime. I suffered some fairly major setbacks in this game, and perhaps on another attempt I could actually pull it off. While I may not have won here, at least I can choose my own demise. Thank you all for watching, and as always, subscribe or don't, I'm not your dad.